Well, good afternoon again. Uh, welcome to the 2020 State of the Lake report. Uh, just bear with me while I... Okay. Um, whoops. Uh, okay, I have those technical difficulties under control. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for, for joining for the third time. Um, in a different time, possibly in a different world, we wouldn't be meeting uh, in this forum. We'd all be together. Uh, we'd be in a large room, uh, sitting sitting by each other, possibly a glass of wine in hand. Um, I'm hopeful those days will come back. Uh, you may well have a glass of wine in your hand. Um, I'm saving mine till, till later. Uh, my name is Jeff Schletter. I'm the director of the UC Davis Tahoe Environmental Research Center. If this is your first time on Zoom, then of course it's not your first time on Zoom. You are all, no doubt, totally sick of Zoom. Uh, and so to begin with, I'd like to thank you for taking yet one more hour uh, and spending it on Zoom uh, with us today. Uh, it's not our favorite forum, but uh, it's really all we have to, to go by with these days. Uh, one of the things we um, have difficulty with on, on these Zoom webinars is dealing with open mic. So as much as I like spontaneity as, as, much, of the next, as much as the next person, possibly more, uh, we're going to have a little less of that. So if you do have any questions, please use the Q&A button uh, to send those questions in. We'll try to answer them at the end. Uh, and if we don't have time, then we'll email you an answer later on. Uh, don't use the chat button because that will go nowhere. Um, okay, so the State of the Lake report is not a score sheet. It's not a score sheet for Lake Tahoe. It's more of an assessment of where we've been uh, in this last year. And I remember thinking about it last January that, uh, wow, 2019, in my mind at least, had not been really exceptional. And I was a little concerned that uh, what today would be, what would, I, what would I be able to talk to you about? Uh, so good news is there's plenty to talk about. Uh, we had COVID, as you well know. Um, and so everything that was on our minds, or at least on my mind, last January and February has now changed. Yet despite this, and because of the efforts of many people, life went on. It was more difficult, it was more extreme. We were doing things we were never used to doing, but we got it done, uh, science was done, education was done, and we'll talk about that uh, during this, this next hour. So uh, at the outset, uh, I did want to thank uh, those organizations, companies uh, that help support the production of this year's State of the Lake Report. Uh, this is something that is important, I believe, and without their support, we couldn't offset the cost. So uh, I'm not gonna read all their names out. You can see them on the screen, but we really do truly appreciate uh, the fact that they are helping us uh, produce a, written, a small number of written reports, but largely an, an online distribution. And so right now you can go online at tahoe.ucdavis.edu and download your very own personal copy of the 2020 State of the Lake Report. Um, I also wanted to thank our sponsors of our speaker series. So today is the second of our summer science speaker series. Um, and so uh, our sponsors of this series uh, have been the Truckee Tahoe Airport District, and Bubba and Susan Crutchfield. Uh, more importantly, or equally importantly, I should say, this is part of our ongoing monthly uh, seminar series. Unfortunately, this year we have had uh, very few of them, although that's going to be changing in the coming weeks. Uh, and our regular sponsors for that uh, annual series are Paul and Alice Baker, Tim and Betty, uh, sorry, Betsy Kozier, David and Dana Lowry, the Muralotus. Lakeshore Resort and Paul and Vicki Twitchell. 
this is a, a presentation about data uh, and data costs money to, to collect. Uh, and it's not just about the data we collected in 2019 or 2015. There's data here that goes back half a century. So it's not really possible to acknowledge all the agencies, all the people, all the foundations, uh, even all the people at UC Davis who have contributed to, uh, to the data you see. So a collective thank you uh, for all of those people who supported the monitoring and many of the special uh, studies that we're describing uh, here today. Um, I'm going to try to remember, as I refer to particular studies that are ongoing, to mention the people who are supporting that, um, but sometimes I forget. So uh, I will do my best, and I do thank you. Okay, this um, to this, uh, this year was a very bittersweet year for us. Um, we had one of our longest serving employees, Scott Hackley, uh, retire. So that's a picture of Scott. It's a very rare picture um, of Scott. Uh, Scott has been for the last 41 years going out in raging streams like this one. Uh, you can see the water is brown, it's turbid, high flows. Normally Scott does this at night, um, which says a lot about him. He goes at night because that's when the flows are highest and he wants to capture that high flow. So when he's not wading dangerously into, into streams around Lake Tahoe to, to measure the flu and collect water samples, he's uh, swimming around the edge of the lake um, in very cold water in a leaking wetsuit, uh, measuring the algae that grow on the rocks around the lake. So uh, we dedicate this year's report to Scott. We, we wish him well. We don't know how we're going to replace him uh, but maybe somebody will be prepared to go out at night and swim in a leaking wetsuit. It's important to remember just how unique Lake Tahoe is. Uh, many of us who do research here, many of the agencies who, who work here, we, we, we're forced almost by the nature of our job to, to look at the, the things that aren't working, or the things that are aren't going as well as we would hope. Uh, and we lose sight of the fact of just how special and unique Tahoe is. So we all know it's one of the deepest lakes of the world, in the world, over 1,600 feet deep. 39 trillion gallons of water fill it. Uh, just the evaporation in a single day from Lake Tahoe uh, would meet the daily water needs of 5 million people. Uh, if we were to empty the, the lake and let it fill in just by, by what the precipitation that happens every year, that would take 600 years. But the thing we lose sight of beyond all, all thought of how big it is, is that there really is no other lake like it. There is no large lake with a population living around it that has the clarity we do. So part of the talk today will be about Tahoe's clarity. It is still the clearest lake in the world, the clearest large lake with a, a permanent and a very large tourist population um, inhabiting its watershed. One of the, the other things that makes Tahoe special is that we have this tremendous body of science focused on Lake Tahoe. In, in the last few years, this has come together, uh, something known as the Tahoe Science Advisory Council, uh, with representatives drawn from, from the group shown here. And in a way, this is, this is providing general overview um, of the science that's being done. And this is important for many of the agencies uh, that, uh, that do have to make decisions based on, on a variety of the science that's coming in. Something else that's special about Tahoe is just how much data we have. So two maps here. Uh, the one on the left is showing all the monitoring stations that Turk operates, some of them in collaboration with others, but the ones we operate on and around the lake. Uh, a photo in the middle, it shows one of our near shore stations. We have 11 of those around the lake that provide real time data, um, literally minute by minute. Um, and again, agencies, private citizens, uh, various foundations have supported these 
these stations. On the right, we should I show you some of the stations uh, that we have in the watershed, where we're monitoring the, primarily the forest, the health of the forest. Uh, photo there of, of a bark beetle, a very charismatic beetle. So, on to the data. And I want to reassure you that climate change is alive and well. So, three graphs here, or four graphs here. The one in the upper left shows air temperature. And this is a lot of data here. This is 110 years of data. And the important things to recognize here, the upper plot, the red one, is the maximum. The lower one is the minimum. And you can see temperatures have been increasing. Uh, not every year, some, some years, some decades, uh, it goes down. Uh, this period is interesting. This is the Dust Bowl period, very warm temperatures, not very different than what we're experiencing now. But when you look at the whole span of time, and especially on the minimum temperatures, it's getting warmer, both nighttime and daytime temperatures. This is exemplified as well by the number of days we have every year with the temperatures below freezing. So again, 110 years of data here. And what the x-axis is showing is the number of days which the temperature, the air temperature is below freezing. Important thing is 110 years ago, there were about 80 years a day with lots and lots of interannual variability. Fast forward 110 years, it's more like 50. And again, this bottom plot is showing the percentage of snow in our precipitation. So it stands to reason if the air temperatures are getting warmer, then we're going to have less snow. Uh, and if precipitation stays the same, which it has actually, uh, less of that will be snow. So 50% uh, back in 1910, uh, more like 35% now, but huge differences, as you can see here, very low to this last year, we had above average uh, precipitation, and we actually had above average snow. And the reason for that was 2019 was both cold and it was wet, which says nothing about climate change. It just says everything about the weather for 2019. So even in a cold year, the lake warms. So this is, um, we, we sometimes call this a, a heat map. So along the, the horizontal here, these are the months of the year. This is for the year 2019. 2020 hasn't been completed yet, so we can't report on that. And this is just showing the upper 250 feet of the lake. The colors indicate the temperature of the water. So here we are in July and August, the surface waters are warm, they're red. And as we go deeper and deeper into the lake, the water progressively gets colder. This is something we call stratification, basically meaning we have different strata, different layers of water, very light, warm water at the surface. And then deeper down, we have cold, more dense water. And it's really difficult for this water to mix. It takes a lot of energy to mix light water with heavy water. It can happen, but you need that energy supply. So if we look at the historical record now, going back to 1968, uh, and each of these bars represents the annual average whole lake temperature. What am I saying with all those words is, this is the average temperature for the whole year for all the water in the lake, top to bottom. So you look at these numbers, they're actually really low, 42 degrees, 43 degrees. It's because Tahoe is so big and so much of it is so cold. But again, this is the water now, we're not talking air temperature. We still have this trend, this trend of warming temperatures in the lake. So most of us don't swim at the bottom of the lake. We don't swim in winter. We like to swim in July. And so this is the record. It's a shorter record now going back to 1999. Uh, this is taken from the buoys that we, we share with NASA 
out in the middle of the lake. Um, and you see there is an overall increase here, most, notice, most noticeably in July 2019 last year, it was really cold. It was way colder than, than it had been the last two years, maybe four or five degrees colder. Part of the reason for that were the colder air temperatures uh, and part was because the lake actually mixed all the way to the bottom. It's a point I glossed over uh, a little bit earlier, but that's something that does happen. It hadn't happened for eight years in Tahoe. When it does happen, uh, it brings a lot of cold water. So if you remember swimming the lake last summer, thinking it was cold, you were absolutely right. Okay, so thinking back to that heat map I showed you, the, the year with the red warm water at the top and the blue cold water at the bottom, as I said, that conveys stability to the lake. It's hard to mix that up. And so uh, uh, an analog of that is this child trying to, to punch this, uh, I guess this punching robot, you could call it. At the bottom of the robot, it's full of sand, which makes it heavy. And this is all inflatable at the top. And every time she punches it, it bounces back. It has, it has stability. It doesn't flip on its head or flip over on its side. We can calculate a number that represents that same kind of stability for the lake. We call it a stratification index. Um, I would love to run through the, the formula for that, but uh, there just isn't time. So take my word for it. These bars represent the value of this stratification index. And once again, hopefully no surprise now, as every year goes by, on average, the lake stratification index is rising. It's getting more resistant to mixing. Again, every year is different, so we shouldn't just focus on one year. This last year, was lower than the trend, but still higher than, um, still part of a longer increasing trend. We can also look at this, how long, how much of the year this stratification is, is lasting. So what we're showing here on this vertical axis is a number of days uh, that the lake is stratified. So, here at the beginning of this trend, it's a hundred and whatever that is, 165. Divide that by 30, that's about five and a half months. So back in the 1970s, this stratified period, let's call it summer, was five and a half months. Fast forward to 2019, that trend line says our summer is now about 195 days. So we've basically gone from 165 to 195 days of stratification. That's a month. So for one month longer than it used to be, Lake Tahoe is more resistant to mixing. So what does that mean? Why does this matter? So here's, um, um, here are some figures that basically give the same data, but in a slightly different way. So this was actually a figure uh, that was produced by a Tahoe Science Advisory Council working group on uh, looking at clarity. It was produced by Alicia Cortez, uh, one of our researchers here at Turk. And these two figures, this is the actually the stratification index, what I just showed you increasing over time. This is something different called the buoyancy frequency, but for all intents and purposes, it's just another way of calculating the stability of the lake, its resistance to mixing. What's interesting and why it does matter is if I now plot the clarity, the annual clarity of Lake Tahoe, we see an opposite trend. So as stratification increases, Clarity has been decreasing over time. So the connection between the two is very complicated. Uh, and 
And that's because climate change, stratification affects everything. And that's something we'll go into um, in a few minutes. So let's change the subject. Um, let's talk about lake level. So lake level, this is measured by the USGS at a gauging station in Lake Tahoe. Uh, what we're seeing here is the record going back to about 1900. Um, so, and you can see that during this period, or actually let me point out two horizontal lines on this graph. This upper one um, is the maximum legal limit that Lake Tahoe can, can occupy. Uh, or can come up to, and that's because we have a dam at the outlet and nobody wants that dam to collapse. And so the water master regulates to the best of his ability uh, the water level in Lake Tahoe. Uh, this lower dash line represents what we call the natural rim. Essentially, if water level goes below this natural rim, water stops flowing out of the, um, uh, down the, the Truckee River. So, and you can see over this 100 plus years, water level has fluctuated. Again, drawing your attention to this long period of generally falling levels. Again, this was the Dust Bowl era. So you can see, you can see our nation's history in the lake levels of Lake Tahoe. I wanna focus in on this uh, period right at the end. So this is the last three years. So you can see here, we're coming out of the drought, um, that we, a five-year drought we experienced. And in the last three years, water levels have been very, generally very high compared with the sorts of fluctuations we've experienced in the past. Um, that actually sounds really good. Lots of water, it's nice and blue. One of the downsides of that um, is that as the water level comes up, our, our beaches start to shrink. Uh, in the summer, uh, many of you have gone to Tahoe beaches, noticed that they're smaller, they notice that they're also very crowded, uh, something we are all trying to avoid, uh, hopefully successfully. Uh, let's switch gears from water level to nutrients. And so these are the nutrients in the lake. So as a reminder, Nutrients are what plants require to grow, primarily nitrogen and phosphorus. So this is data going back to about 1980. Um, and this, this is just the annual average concentrations of nitrate and orthophosphate, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, and, and these trends are, I mean, up to about five or six years ago, there appeared to be very little sort of increasing or decreasing trend in nitrate. But the last few years seems to be increasing for reasons still not understood. The phosphorus on the other hand, had a very definite decrease um, in concentrations in the lake. But again, in the last 10 years, that seems to be, that seems to be changing. It seems to be increasing, although when things like climate change are major drivers, 10 years is a very small period of time. One of the consequences of these higher nutrients and the higher lake levels and stable lake levels is the growth of paraphyton. So paraphyton, you may know it better as that slimy, slippery stuff on the rocks um, is shown shown in this image on the left. So that's Brant Allen diving uh, and taking measurements on, uh, uh, of the paraphyte. And I can tell it's Brant and not Scott because he doesn't have a leaking wetsuit. So uh, this is something we, we do for six months of the year, about every two weeks. So this is a program that's been funded by the Lahontan Regional Water Quality Control Board. Paraphyte and start growing uh, profusely in about January or February, reach a peak um, in the spring, maybe uh, in April or May. And then after that, they basically die off. And when they die off, they break free of the rocks. And some of you may have seen these, these mats floating free on the lake or washing up on beaches. They're pretty disgusting, but, but that's nature. Uh, if there was less of this, 
there would be less of that. So in 2019, as in all other years, we actually take a survey around the peak uh, of their growth all around the lake. And 2019 was a particularly bad year. So here we have an index, it's color coded here. Red obviously is the worst. Uh, this pale green is the best. And generally the west shore of Lake Tahoe uh, has higher periphyte, I mean poorer near shore conditions uh, than the east. And this was really exemplified this last year. The reason we believe it was so bad this year, as I said, high stable water levels and the higher nutrient levels uh, that we have. So there's something else akin to periphyton, but very different. It's called metaphyton. So the periphyton are rigidly attached to the rocks. Metaphyton is something else. It's, it's not a, an algal cell that's near invisible floating around. It's more a stringy filamentous collective of of phytoplankton cells that, that if you were to just wade into the water here, um, it would just blow away in response to you walking by it. Uh, and what we've noticed is that there's been an increase uh, in this in the last few years. So uh, 2014 was a year of very low water level. And so we can see a lot of this metaphyton washing up on the beaches here. It's if you've experienced that, you know how unpleasant it is. 2019, high water levels, very little beach for it to wash up on, so it just gets pounded by the, by the waves, and so the water becomes very green and, and pretty, pretty poor looking. Mala Bay, beautiful clear bay, so you can see these, these stringy blobs of metaphyton clearly at the bottom. Um, on the sandy on the sandy beach. One thing to note um, in this in this image are these shells. And if we were all sitting in the same room, I would quiz you now. What do you think those are? And as as one, you would all rise up and say Asian clams, and you would be right as usual. These are Asian clams. So actually, they're just the shells from. Asian clams that have since passed on. And it's no coincidence that where we have Asian clams, we also have metaphyton. So uh, in a project that was uh, funded by Nevada Division of State Lands, uh, we are looking at both how to measure metaphyton, but also what the connection is between clams and, and the metaphyton. Okay. So as part of that study, I mentioned, uh, as well as being on the water and measuring what, what the concentrations and locations of the metaphyton were, um, well, that's actually something that's pretty hard to do underwater because uh, the perimeter of Lake Tahoe is, is long. It's something like 72 miles uh, around. And, not even Scott wants to snorkel and swim around that uh, length of shoreline. So instead, we've tried a couple of different things. Uh, one of these things was we were using helicopters. So we have cameras strapped here. Uh, and I want a special call out to Mike Bruno. Uh, he was both provided the helicopter and piloted for us. Um, and so in two hours, we were able to literally circumnavigate the lake and take imagery of the entire shore and see where the metaphyton were. Um, and to see from year to year, or month to month, how, that, how its distribution was changing. Uh, we also deployed drones. So, uh, and each of these vehicles ha has, have their own advantages. The helicopter can go very fast, very quickly. The drones can take a lot more detail in a much smaller area. When you, com when you combine that with the ground truthing that the diver does under the water, then you actually have a very powerful set of tools that operate at different scales, literally at the scale of the patch of paraphyton, at the whole bay scale that the drone can give you, 
and then at the whole lake scale and even the regional scale. There are, there are lakes in the, in the Sierra that are starting to get metified and things, lakes that you would think would be absolutely pristine. Okay, um, moving on. So uh, at some point, we're, uh, we have to come to clarity because, not because clarity is the only thing. Um, and nobody is saying it is. Clarity is a really useful thing because it's an integrator of many things that are happening in the lake. It's also the variable that we have the longest data set for. Actually going back to, I was going to say 1959, but um, back in the, the last century, the century before in the 1870s and 1880s, there were measurements taken of clarity using a, a um, 10 inch round white disc. So since 1968, this is the trend of clarity as measured by Secchi disc. So the bad news is uh, 2019 had very low Secchi depth, 62.7 feet, second lowest year on record. Uh, just to show you historically what clarity Secchi depth had been at Tahoe, in Tahoe, this is a green dash line shows it's near 97 feet. And that's the value that many agency programs around the basin are trying to achieve. But the thing that stands out to me in this figure, well, the least thing that stands out to me is that clarity went down this year, it went down from uh, what it had been the year before to, to 62.7 feet. I don't want to dwell on the year to year because the year before that, we'd actually had a 10 foot improvement. What stands out to me is this plateau, that we had decline in clarity for a long time. And then in the last 10 or 20 years, it's stabilized, but this is our target down here. So the question is, why did clarity go down? Um, and more importantly, why does it appear to have plateaued? So the answer um, is really for, for all the reasons that I've been talking about up to this point. Um, and so some of those reasons are there are still excessive fine particles and nutrients entering the lake. Tremendous amount of effort and ingenuity at reducing those, but there are still more than the lake should have. The changing seasons, uh, this has to do with that lengthening of the summer, as I mentioned before, um, has a lot to do with it before. That affects when we get spring runoff from the streams and because the temperatures in the lake and in the streams are different, where the fine particles and the nutrients enter the lake changes from those streams. Uh, algal blooms are changing. We used to have larger algae, now we're having much smaller ones. A lot more of them are closer to the surface where they can impact uh, the, the surface clarity and how far down we see the the uh, Secchi depth and also the Secchi disc and the stability. That favors very small particles, very small algae. When you have stability, you don't get mixing and large algae sink out. Large algae don't affect clarity. Fine algae, small algae stay near the surface. Okay. Red box around this is because each of these are in some way impacted by climate change. Okay, so what can we do about it? So clearly climate change is exerting a growing impact over time. Uh, it's complex, complex connections. Uh, the whole story isn't fully understood that knowledge is, is growing. Uh, I, I mentioned the, you know, the real progress in changing what was that declining 
trajectory of clarity to at least a plateau now. We're not losing clarity year after year as we were decades ago. Um, but that took a lot of investment. One, somewhere between one or two billion dollars was invested. And well, I, I, I don't think I have to tell you that future dollars uh, for public investment and investment at Tahoe may be somewhat uncertain. And the final thing uh, that concerns me is that many of the best projects have probably been done. The, part, the, the projects that gave us the biggest bang for the buck appear to have been done. Uh, very smart people designing these projects in the basin and they do the cheapest and most effective first. So really what we need is maybe different solutions, clearly sustainable solutions, because we're unlikely to have one or $2 billion more. It'd be great if we did, we'd be all for it. So with that, let me introduce you to the Mysa shrimp. So beautiful creature, a face that only a mother could love. The Mysa shrimp has an interesting story at Lake Tahoe. It was introduced in the 1960s by fish and game departments from both California and Nevada. The idea was provide supplemental food for fish. Fish would get bigger, fishermen would be happier. End of story. Uh, well, unfortunately, the story didn't end there. Um, a lot of research was done. Um, on mysis back when they were introduced in the 60s and the 70s um, and some pretty solid results were obtained. Uh, one of the things we, no, sorry, we, I wasn't there, um, but one of the things that was detected at the time was that they pretty much ate some of the zooplankton, some of the small animals there selectively. So what they picked on, what they liked, because it's supposedly delicious, um, is the Daphnia and its relative Bos minor. So mysis came in, they pretty much took care of Daphnia and Bos minor. There were some changes to the fisheries and that, that was a, those sorts of things were observed in many lakes around the West. And then people lost interest because it was a done deal and they moved on. Uh, and, and a few times since the 70s, we kept doing surveys and they were right. The mysis were here and they weren't going anywhere. Um, so about nine years ago, we started a program looking at Emerald Bay. Um, and so from uh, went out one night, it was, a, it was in November, and what they, what they, I wasn't there, um, what they noticed is this is sort of a graph showing the numbers of mysis um, against time. So they started off here and much of their surprise, they noticed very few mysis were present. Well, how much is a lot of mysis? How much is a few mysis? Well, again, this green dashed line gives you an idea. Typical values in Emerald Bay and, and probably Tahoe as well are around 100 individuals per square meter and we were down sort of in the zero to, to five or 10 for two years. Okay, that was surprise number one. Surprise number two was that over this same period of time, Daphnia, that zooplankton I mentioned that mysis had taken care of so conveniently, was suddenly present again. And just to give you an idea of what their normal numbers were, normal numbers zero. So suddenly they're up around three or 4,000 per cubic meter. And, and in a way that wasn't so surprising. I mean, they came back was a bit of a surprise, but we, we sort of knew that if there were no mysis there, it would, uh, Daphnia would possibly come back. The big surprise was second death was clarity. So again, in Emerald Bay, clarity, secchi depth is normally about 40 feet. Um, 
And what happened during this two year period is clarity went from around 40 feet to even reaching 80 feet. You know, during this period of time, clarity in Emerald Bay was clearer than in Lake Tahoe. And I should add in Lake Tahoe, the mices weren't going anywhere. They were still there. So this was just happening in Emerald Bay. So uh, for the three years following that, we kept sampling Emerald Bay. And what did we see? We saw eventually the mysis numbers pop back and they're starting to hover around what they had historically been, about 100 individuals per square meter. The Daphnia, once the mysis returned, pretty much died away again. And Clarity, the Secchi depth, also returned to its previous level. So here we, here we are, six years of data showing two things. What happens when you get rid of mysis, or sorry, when mysis disappear, and then the converse, when mysis return and the impacts on the clarity. So, the long and the short of this, curiosity driven research led to a new realization if mysis are absent, Daphne return, and big and clarity returns along with it. And this nexus between mysis, Daphne, and clarity was actually, was, was new. Nobody had made this connection. The connection between mysis and Daphne, we, um, we know that. Our long-term uh, boat captain, Bob Richards, did that for his master's research 30 years ago. Actually, he was there when they were introduced. Um, and that's what he saw. But the clarity connection, it has taken decades to, to be able to see that. But what we have from this is a potential new tool for Tahoe's restoration and one that potentially has climate change insurance built in. I mean, this is, um, climate change is affecting many things, but this seems to be immune to it. So let me summarize what I just said. So pre-1963, before mysis were introduced, this is sort of what Lake Tahoe looked like. Blue, Lots of Daphnia, there were some small, tiny little algal cells, there was silt and clay, and there were big algal cells. Introduce the mysis, and this is what happens. The mysis come along, they grow in number. I mean, here I'm showing it growing in size. Actually, the mysis is about 100 times larger, or 10 times larger than the mysis. Uh, other than Daphnia, it consumes the Daphnia, it consumes the large algae, and now there's nothing, in the absence of Daphnia, there's nothing left to consume the fine particles and the small algae. They proliferate and account for the, the increasing loss of clarity. So even though fine particles have no doubt gone up on account of development. The fact that we've lost one of the natural clearing mechanisms is, is important. So here's a new conceptual model. Um, and so here you have lake trout, and here you have secchi depth, and here in between you have some of the things that connect the food webs of the lake. So I'm gonna focus on the Daphnia right here. And so you see all these arrows and there are little plus or minus signs there. So basically, if we look at this arrow, this is the arrow between the mysis and the Daphnia. If as mysis consume Daphnia, they decrease, they disappear. When they disappear, there is no disappearance of fine algae. There is no disappearance of fine particles. Clarity suffers. When you get rid of mysis, the opposite happens. Daphnia come back, as we saw, good things happen down here. There are connections as well between Daphnia and planktivorous fish, the native fish we have in the lake. But there's a lot more work that needs to be done there, uh, including a review of a lot of the past work. Okay, so in light of this, we found this out some years ago. 
uh, we, we started a trolling experiment, asking the question, is it possible not to just rely on mice as disappearing at will, but can we, at our will, make them disappear? And so with funding from the California Tahoe Conservancy and the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection, uh, our staff were elated to learn that not only could they work during the day, but they could go out at night to troll for mysis in Emerald Bay. So this is, these are just some photos um, of that operation. You can't see them smiling, but trust me, they were very happy working in freezing conditions at night in Emerald Bay. Um, and they were guided by some very sophisticated sonar equipment telling them where the mysis were horizontally and, and vertically. <sighs> so right now, well, that project actually is wrapping up now. Uh, and some of the things we've learned is when to remove mysis, how to remove mysis, uh, what seasons, what depths, uh, what size nets. These were things that, uh, that weren't known, and we know that now. But really the biggest thing, especially if we do talk about the sustainability, and that's the whole purpose here. Um, if we want another tool to help improve clarity and we don't have a billion dollars, then somehow it has to pay for itself. And in order to pay for itself, there needs to be a market. And so in partnership uh, with a group of students from the Graduate School of Management at UC Davis, they set about trying to find a market for mice or shrimp. So after any market surveys, cost analyses, looking at uh, growth potential for the market, uh, what are the local employment opportunities, what they settled on. And they were looking at aquarium food and human food and a whole range of things. But the, the best looking thing was dog treats. Uh, we, <laughs> we even did lab tests. So, um, sorry. Um, what makes the mice so attractive um, is that they live in Lake Tahoe and they eat what's in Lake Tahoe um, and everything in Tahoe is very high in omega-3 fatty acids. So it's very high in EPA and DHA and very importantly, it's very low in fat. It's one thing. The other is Lake Tahoe is pure. We don't have any sewage water going into Tahoe. So we don't have any pharmaceuticals, any endocrine disruptors, estrogen, everything that, that comes out of us and goes to a sewage treatment plant, goes somewhere else. It doesn't come into the lake. These are things that ultimately, wherever they end up, get into the food web. We don't get that in what's in Lake Tahoe. We have no industry, uh, polluting industry anyway. We don't have any polluting agriculture. This is as pure a system as you find. And so there's a real market edge here um, in having um, omega-3s from Lake Tahoe. So I'm gonna stop on the, on the mysis uh, and talk about some of the other things uh, that have been done in 2019 uh, and as extensions of, of longer term projects. And one of, one of the efforts that I guess we're all really proud of um, is the work that Trisha Maloney's lab uh, has been doing on sugar pine reforestation. So we all remember the, the great drought of 2012 to 2016 during that time, over 70,000 trees in the Tahoe Basin died. And they didn't just die you know, one here and one there. There were large swaths of them that died because of the aspect or of the, of the uh, land or the soil types. But even amongst those swaths of death, there were some trees that were just fine. They had something in their DNA that made them resilient to, to the drought or to uh, infestation by, by bark beetles. And so Tricia and her team honed in on that. They started collecting seeds from these resilient survivors, uh, uh, germinated them, put them, uh, raised them in a lath house here. And then a couple of years later, with help from the California Conservation Corps, 
uh, replanted almost 5,000 of them in 2019. Uh, and now uh, they're following on from this, uh, trying to understand what it is about these trees that is different, uh, what their genetics are, what their phenology is. Uh, and so in this last half, they're able to simulate droughts and see how particular trees uh, respond to that uh, and, and collecting data on their resilience to insect attack. So this, fund, this work has been funded by many people now, uh, California Tahoe Conservancy, U.S. Forest Service, and the Tahoe Fund were really instrumental in starting this off. All right, so here's a topic uh, you've probably never heard me talk about at Lake Tahoe before. Um, and I never thought I would talk about it. So harmful algal blooms. So that really disgusting photo on the left is, is not from Lake Tahoe. Um, this is Soda Bay at Clear Lake. Um, and this is sort of a very small embayment there. Uh, and, and Clear Lake is, is where we have um, been doing a lot of work in the last two to three years. Uh, and it's prone to harmful algal blooms. So these are uh, primarily cyanobacteria, uh, some of which are toxic, toxic to humans, toxic to animals. Even without the toxicity, you can see this would not be, this would not be a picture of a bay at Lake Tahoe you would like to see. Uh, this uh, photo here is some of the work at, uh, at Lake Tahoe, uh, sorry, at Clear Lake, using a, um, uh, an autonomous underwater vehicle. So why am I talking about, about this? Well, for one reason, I want to highlight some of the work that's being done by one of our PhD students, Samantha Sharp. Um, and I am gonna come back to what, how this impacts Lake Tahoe. So this is a section of, of Clear Lake. Um, this green blob here is an image, or a set of images taken from, from a drone flight above the water. And you can see the green represents fluorescence from, from the cyanobacteria. Uh, and it's not, it's not uniform. There's this really bright area here, high levels. Superimposed on that, these dashed lines represent satellite images uh, or the size of satellite images from Sentinel-3. So if you're looking at satellite images, you're losing a lot of detail and through that detail, a lot of understanding. So satellite image at this scale, this image shows what you get from a drone. This white track represents that autonomous underwater vehicle moving along a predetermined path, taking measurements of what's right there at the air-water interface, understanding literally inch by inch how that's changing. These pink dots represent uh, where physical samples are taken. Again, you're saying, well, this is Clear Lake, this isn't Lake Tahoe, why do we need to know this? Let's go back to an earlier graph showing the July water temperatures. And here, this is 2017, 68 degrees. This is the average. So during the day, water temperatures were warmer than this, and at night they were colder than this. Turns out 68 degrees is pretty much the threshold at which you can start having harmful algal blooms. It's obviously not the only threshold. It's more than just temperature. Nutrients uh, are important. But there are parts of Tahoe, say some of the um, marinas on the South Shore, uh, that get discharges from urban runoff that have very high nutrient levels, very warm temperatures, and in July are very prone now because of our warming temperatures to harmful algal blooms. Plastics, microplastics, well, very topical. Uh, you've no doubt heard about the, the giant island floating in the middle of the Pacific made up of plastic. There is no giant island floating in the middle of Lake Tahoe. Unless you um, wonder what this is. Uh, this is actually a manta troll. This is a troll we're using to collect 
microplastics across the surface of Lake Tahoe. We're also collecting Asian clams to see what microplastics they may have ingested. Uh, we're also getting the guts of fish from fishing guides to see what they may have ingested. So basically what we're looking at is within Lake Tahoe itself, where are microplastics? As I said before, we don't get sewage discharges into Lake Tahoe. So that's a, as a potential source is removed. But we do have drains going into Tahoe. We do have litter. Um, and so where that ends up and how it may affect us in the water we drink is important. We're also partnering uh, with Rayleigh's and with other groups around the, the basin uh, to encourage people to drink Tahoe tap and to, to use reusable uh, water bottles. Most of the plastic that enters the lake comes from basically one use plastic that uh, we as a society leave on the beach or, or they, they just blow out of our cars. And so we can actually do something about a large fraction of this. So there's some action we're taking and education is obviously another part of this. So we're working here with uh, students at Incline High on their use of, of uh, one-time plastics, their school's policies and what they can do. And uh, a friend asked me a couple of days ago or commented they'd never seen uh, plastics in Lake Tahoe. So um, you know who you are. Uh, and this was just a harvest from just one day last summer. Okay, so enough about microplastics and harmful algal blooms and climate change and all of these, uh, these terrible problems. Uh, let's have fun, let's do paddle boarding. But of course, I have to take the fun out of that too. So here goes, the perils of poorly prepared paddle boarding. Okay, so you've hopefully learned enough so far um, about Lake Tahoe. So in this first image, we have say, a schematic of Lake Tahoe and somebody paddle boarding and the colors indicating the warm water at the surface, the stratified water going down to cold water at the bottom. Okay, that's day one. Day two, day two is very windy. So Paddle boarders, very intelligent people. Uh, but what happens, and they're not going paddle boarding, but what happens to the lake when it's stratified and the wind blows very strongly is that it tilts. And so here on the windward side, where the wind is coming from, cold water from the bottom comes up, warm water gets pushed across. Okay, so. Um, day three, what happens day three? Now you, um, you all think your cameras are turned off, but I actually has, I can see you all. So um, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hands if you think that on day three, when the wind has stopped, I'll give you a clue. It's now not windy anymore. On day three, will the lake return to this? Or what? So who thinks, who thinks the lake's gonna return to that? Okay, I can see some of you do, some of you are non-committal, some of you are trying to turn off your cameras. That's all right. That is not what happens on day three. That's actually what happens on day four. So I'm gonna show you what happens on day three and it may scare you, and it relates to the perils of paddle boarding. So this is the result of a, of a computer simulation of what happens when the wind blows at Lake Tahoe. So this is day three. So this is based on real wind data and a very sophisticated model. So what you're seeing here on the right-hand side is the surface water temperature. And so it's, it's very red here, it's very warm. The wind was blowing from the southwest, from the lower left to the northeast, upper right. And so on day three, even though the wind has dropped, the water takes a lot longer to 
to return to what it had been. And so what you see is red here, blue there. This blue water is 42 degrees Fahrenheit. So, um, so let me just continue. These, these uh, lines here show the currents that are produced at the same time as that water starting to, to flow back. And these red areas indicate currents that are something like um, you know, 0.8 miles per hour, which doesn't sound much, but that's about two feet per second. So here you are on day three, wind has dropped, you're out there paddle boarding, and if you're as good at it as I am, you will undoubtedly fall off your board at some stage. When that happens, you will be subject to hypothermia. And if your board is not tethered to you, it will start moving away from you at about two feet per second. At that point, it could be, a, it could be one of those moments for you uh, where thoughts race through your mind. Things like, maybe I should have given more money to Turk research, but it could be too late. So to avoid that, to avoid that possibility, beware of the upwind side of a lake a day after strong winds. Wear a life preserver, wear a tether, and study limnology. If your kids are looking at going to college, it could not be a finer degree. It could save your life. So um, in coming to a close, I want to return to a theme from the beginning, and that's how we, this idea of Tahu really is special. And it's not just special for us. You know, we get to live here or work here or vacation here. It's special to people around the world. So um, this is a, a view of the lakes of Northern Patagonia. Um, and this is part of a partnership that we've entered into with a number of groups there. Um, I guess primarily uh, a, a nonprofit foundation there, Chile Lagos Limpios. So Turk, um, and actually together with the League to Save Lake Tahoe and um, the, the TRPA, uh, we're working with with these groups here to do what we've done at Tahoe in a way. So this beautiful part of Northern Patagonia, and I, I just point out there are 23 lakes here and I've labeled three of them, seven, 13, and 21. These are the three lakes we're currently studying. Um, the challenge they're facing is people are moving to these lakes, urban areas are being built up, they're considering changes in land use, they have climate change, they have everything that Tahoe has experienced for 50 years. And they're actually asking us, what would you do if you're in our position? Unfortunately, we are in a very good position to, to tell them what we know, uh, to tell them the things we got right, to tell them the things, well, if we had our time over again, we would do things differently. So this is a case of where we don't realize how much has been done at Tahoe, by, but not just by, through research, but by, by, by the governance of, of this place. And so it's really encouraging that people are turning to us and that we have the experience to, to, to be able to reach out. And the other side of that is you actually learn a lot by studying a place that is very similar yet different to your own place. So in conclusion, I want to point out just how difficult this has been for our staff. Um, I mean, everybody is, everybody's life is um, turned upside down and everybody is dealing with, with so much. Um, personally, professionally, health-wise, and the like. But uh, I guess our first experience with COVID was I, I, I was on sabbatical in Chile. I got a phone call from Heather Sigali on a Saturday morning saying, Science Expo starts on Monday. <laughs> um, I can't remember the exact date. Maybe it was February 28th, something like that. Um, 
and I don't know what to do. San Francisco is just basically closing down. There's not no information here. In two days, I'm going to have a thousand kids. I'm going to have docents. Our cleaning supplies, our hand sanitizer hasn't come in. So a very agonizing decision seemed like at the time we closed Science Expo down for that week. Literally within a week, the states of California and Nevada, I'd like to say, followed our lead. But the events of the world were changing really rapidly. So for our education team, it's been really difficult serving a non-existent population. Um, but they have done well. They, uh, everything is now moving towards being virtual. Uh, starting programs again, like uh, this uh, reading groups with kids and with docents uh, leading it. Kids all wearing masks, kids all separated. Uh, our research, our researchers have to operate solely on boats. They have to drive uh, boats with masks, they have to disinfect every surface on the boat because who knows who touches it when you're not there. Very trying and they've held up admirably. So with that, I'd like to thank them. I'd like to thank you for being here. Um, if you have any more, if you have specific questions, I mean, I am going to try to get to some questions now. Um, but feel free to reach out to me uh, and I can put you in touch with any of our research teams. Reach out to Heather Sigali uh, for questions about our education programs and adaptations where we're making um, and Tony Mishakova um, for, for reaching out and knowing uh, and getting information on how you can support research and education at Lake Tahoe. So here I am, I'm in my office and I've got uh, a number of questions here. Um, and um, so this is always the awkward part, um, is trying to read these questions and see which ones um, I can answer. Uh, so, okay, here's one. I've heard discussions about the effect of microplastic on water quality. Does anyone think that the fact that new and rebuilt piers uh, which are being constructed of treks uh, will have a significant impact. That's actually a very good question. Um, I cannot answer that, but I would be happy to look into that. I know, uh, and this is quite, this was something that I was very excited about 12 months ago. I told very few people about this, but uh, in some of our water samples uh, that we took in the lake, we actually found um, glass fibers. So these were, uh, I can't remember the exact diameter, oh, no, near invisible glass fibers. Um, and what we concluded in the end, and it was, it was only partially conclusive, is that this was, uh, these were glass fibers from fiberglass boats. Just abrasion on, on the bottom when they're up on the sand, um, those glass fibers get into the water. So whether treks or, or, or similar materials do break down, um, we can try to look into that for you. Uh, a question here about herbicides in Tahoe Keys. I understand the ultraviolet light project showed promise. How's that doing? Um, actually, that's a, a very timely question because the Tahoe Science Advisory Council, I mentioned before, representatives from a number of universities in California, Nevada, um, are act have actually formed a group to meet with the um, the Tahoe groups, Tahoe Keys group uh, and their consultants to look over their findings. Uh, and so in a way that's providing external review of that. I, I mean, I can't comment on it because I haven't looked at it, but, but hopefully uh, in, the, in the coming months, they will be able to at least pass some kind of opinion on that. I'm not sure if they're actually being asked to, to pass judgment. So uh, a question on mysis. I'm always partial to a question on mysis. What does mysis eat when there are no Daphnia present? Uh, that's a good question. Um, they're pretty much 
omnivorous. They eat anything that that is of the right size. So they don't eat the cyclotella because they're just too small. The cyclotella are about a thousand times smaller than a mice. So it's like it's like us. We would much rather have a bagel than be eating the poppy seeds. Um, so, but there are other zooplankton uh, in Lake Tahoe that they're, they're not very effective at clearing the water. So mice can eat those. Uh, they eat uh, some of the they eat the larger algae, so they keep those under control. Um, there's plenty there for them to eat by way of these, these other zooplankton, other zooplankton that don't have the water clearing capacity of, of the Daphnia. Um, is it possible to introduce a filter feed of fish to address the mysis shrimp issue? Well, anything is possible. Um, but I should add here, um, I was born in Australia. Um, Australia is a country known for having introduced a lot of different species. Nearly all of them have created environmental havoc, whether it's the cane toad, whether it's the rabbit, you name it, we did it, we screwed up. I would be very disinclined to introduce, personally, to introduce another species to get rid of a first invasive species. Uh, can, uh, question here, can we estimate the relative contribution to loss of clarity between sediment and nutrients, number one, and the mysis daphnia connection? Uh, basically, I'm taking this question to be how important is controlling what comes into the lake. So the salt is related to the activities that are taking place in the watershed and how important uh, is this food web connection, uh, uh, restoring Daphnia and having them take care of it. Um, I don't think I can provide a hard number, but I again can come back to the example of Emerald Bay uh, and those of you who have been to Emerald Bay, and it's the most visited part of the lake, so you, you probably have been at some point, it basically drains from desolation wilderness. So there's not a whole lot coming in there. Uh, its clarity isn't very good, mainly because the size of the watershed is big compared to, to Emerald Bay itself. But the fact that in two years, Clarity improved 40 feet says a lot, to, in my mind, to the ability of Daphnia to remove fine particles. And I had some little factoids actually contained in the uh, report, um, and I think I can, um, I think I can recall them. Um, and basically, a single Daphnia can remove a hundred thousand fine particles in an hour. And so a Daphnia in a gallon of water would clear it of everything that's in it in about seven days, seven to 10 days. Typically in a gallon of water, you would have 20 Daphnia. So in very broad numbers, Daphnia can keep up based on the data we have with the sorts of inputs that happen in a, on a typical day. But no day is typical. 2017, the huge winter after the, uh, after the drought, large number of fine particles came in from the stream. Clarity really went downhill quickly. I don't know if they could handle that. The data I give you about, or just mentioned about the clearing rate of Daphnia, how many particles they eat, they came from, from laboratory studies. It's very hard to measure that. Um, uh, they're widely used. They have been validated in other places, but th there are uncertainties. There's more, there's more that needs to be done. But it's, I don't believe, based on the data available, that this is just a a small percentage effect. I think the, you know, these two approaches, in a way, 
the watershed approach where you're doing everything you can to stop things getting into the lake. And the reason they're getting into the lake is because we've urbanized it it's so much. Um, and then what you can do to restore not just the Daphnia, but the entire ecosystem that existed here before, uh, the more we can do to do that will help Tahoe be closer to what it was. Tahoe was doing just fine before we came along. We're never, obviously never going to be back at, at, uh, under those conditions, but the kind of functions that did operate under those conditions is what we do need to work towards restoring. Okay. Um, oh, a thank you for me. Well, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, is the trawling actually reducing substantially the number of mice? Oh, this is a question I hope nobody would ask. Um, so, um, in reality, um, tro the trawling sounds pretty straightforward. It turns out it's a lot more difficult than you would, than, at least than I would imagine. You may know how difficult it is. It's um, a lot of experimentation was required just to get the net size right. So we acquired uh, from some colleagues on the East Coast what was called a mysis net. And when we deployed that for many nights, we came back with, with no mysis. Uh, the net was just too coarse. Um, and so it took a lot of experimentation and uh, kind of had sewing bees, people sitting around sewing giant nets to come up finally with the, an appropriate net size, at which point our numbers did go up. Uh, one of the things we learned is that we're not, we're not professional fishermen. And there's a reason there are such things as professional fishermen. Um, and so in the last few months, we have been talking with professional trawlers um, and looking at the efficiencies with which they can catch these and the efficiencies with which we can, can catch and trawl for shrimp. It seems they can do it a whole lot faster than we can, which is great because that was one of our concerns. Can we do this fast enough? Um, and so we're actually sort of talking about a new pilot project uh, that has a goal of actually removing enough mysis from Emerald Bay in a three month period that over the next two or three years, we could measure uh, not just the increase in clarity, not just the return of Daphnia, but also start looking at the effect through the food web. What's the effect on the, on the kokanee? What's the effect on the, on the native fish? So that's, that's the point uh, we're at now. While that's happening, uh, we'll be using the catch, the mysis catch, to actually start producing these dog treats um, and start getting some money to offset the cost of, uh, of running this trawling operation and coming up, figuring out the nuts and bolts of how you scale this up. So I have to I mean, in case anybody is, is confused, we're not currently talking about trawling for mysis in Tahoe. We will. But right now, our demonstration will be Emerald Bay. How you tr scale up to something the size of Tahoe is a different question. And people actually say, well, how long will it, how long will that take? Um, and that's a question akin to how long is a piece of string? If the will is there uh, amongst the community, the agencies, and, and everybody who has to weigh in on this, it could be done in a relatively short time. Uh, it will depend on how much trawling effort is there. If we want to have five trawlers operating four months a year um, at night at Lake Tahoe, it will be quicker than just having one. Uh, so that's, you know, that, that's part of a, a debate that hasn't even started yet that will need to take place. Okay, uh, and please feel free to, to contact me directly or anybody else on the research team. You can go onto the, our website, 
um, and find anybody there and send your questions to them. So here's a question from a, a name I is very familiar to me, good afternoon, Ted. Uh, has anyone looked at the possibility that recent increase in nitrogen concentration is due to metaphyton or paraphyton nitrogen fixation? So Ted, you and I understand that question. Let me try to um, put that in, in terms for everybody else to understand what Ted is asking. And I should say, Ted uh, did his PhD at Lake Tahoe many years ago and was instrumental in a lot of the science behind restoring clarity. Um, no, um, the answer to your question is no. What he's asking is, do these algae, the metaphyton and the paraphyton, actually take in dissolved nitrogen from the water and convert that to nitrate and ammonium? Do they literally add to the nutrients by taking atmospheric nitrogen? So I say no in that nobody has looked at that. Um, and that may be an interesting question. There are other theories as to why um, nitrogen has been increasing, but a lot of them are all theories at this stage. Um, but it is, it is a mystery because there's been a lot of effort to restore uh, wetlands, to restore streams, uh, to remove sources of nutrients from the urban areas so that nitrogen is showing up again, um, is increasing, is a concern. One of the largest sources of nitrogen to the lake is atmospheric deposition, literally nitrogen falling from the sky. Um, I would have thought that with more and more electrification of our vehicle fleet, that would have started to come down. Even before electrification, cars are way more efficient now than they were in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, maybe it's just there are more cars um, in the basin. And so that could be a driver for for increasing nitrogen. So, um, in Emerald Bay, reading another question, the chlorophyll values decrease along with increases in Daphnia. Um, so the question is, do algae, did algae increase? Um, and that's actually a question I did know the answer to, but I'm afraid I'm a little bit frazzled at this point. I cannot answer that, but I will get back to that, to that questioner. So at this point, um, it's 1.23. Um, at this point, I am going to have to end this. Uh, I, so once again, um, I wanted to thank, to thank, well, first of all, thank everybody who did, who did tune in today, who did join us for the State of the Lake. The report is out if you um, didn't catch something. And there's also a lot more information in there than I could present. So uh, just go to tahoe.ucdavis.edu and you can, you can download it. Um, yeah, you can follow up with questions to all of us. Uh, again, for to those from agencies and foundations and the public who have supported us, and, uh, not just for the production of the report, but to do the work. Uh, we really appreciate it. So with that, um, I bid you a, uh, a farewell. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay distant from your friends, wear a mask, and uh, keep doing what you're doing for Lake Tahoe.